Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jorge. <laughs> and uh, I want, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Sala, the Bersa family, uh, Dr. the chairman, of course, because I am here like in my family. You know, I feel perfectly with the friendly atmosphere that I have. Here I have uh, so many friends uh, of the forum. Dental XP told Maurice that I know perfectly well. And of course, I want to dedicate this lecture to the young people because the future of implantology is on the young people. But don't get me wrong. Young people is every man who still can learn. It's not a matter of age. It's a matter of mentality. So to you, I'm going to speak because what I'm going to tell sometimes is uh, not nice. <laughs> OK. My lecture is, can we preserve nature to optimize the outcome? It's a question. And I tell you the end. Yes, of course. This, this is the, my comfort. Yes, we can. And we should. Since 1999, from Lazara's article, we are dealing with immediate implantology. And we were very, very happy the first years. But nowadays, we are having problems. And today, I want to share you this, that what happens if we don't preserve nature? Because I want to tell you two things. One, we have to preserve, but I want to warn you what is happening to us with that we don't still realize perfectly. And how can we do this? Looking at the literature. We are going today to see some articles. But before this, you're going to see some images that it happened every day, for example, at the forum at Dental XP. Dr. Joe Kahn, a super specialist in plantologies on the aesthetic area. Look what he showed, he shared, he was so brave to, to share this kind of articles. Look at this. A perfectly successful implant, immediate implant, six years successfully, completely successfully. And he said, I, I, I travel around the world showing this, one of the first cases of immediate implantology. Uh, the implant is, was very big, very wide. By that time, we used this kind of implants in the aesthetic area. And 10 years later, the patient came this way. And so he was so astonished. Uh, and he said, oh, what a failure. What happened here? So look at the CBCT image. The implant seems to be out of the box frame. And he said, what happened? Who put that implant outside the bone? You see? So his conclusion, first he said, this only happens in California. It only happened to me. Oh my god. And he found that it says, no, this, and this is nature. This is inevitable, the, the buccal plate resorption. But is it? This is what I'm going to, to, to talk about. OK. On the forums, we see this kind of cases every day. Because we, on, we don't only post nice things. We, we also post awful things, ugly things, things that worry us. Look at this. No vocal plate. And the patient thinks, says that this is a little bit bluish or grayish shadow. What, what, what's happening? Another case, if you see the x-ray, you see, oh, this is a good implant. But what, look what is happening. Little by little, the, the threads are emerging. <laughs> you say, well, is the implant moving? No, it's not moving. The bone is going, res taking resorption. OK. You can see the pressure there. Look, this is a very in interesting case. The patient needs to take out this canine, a failure of, of the prosthesis. And when he takes out, look what happened. Oh, what a big problem. Why? If we 
see this line. Look at this point. We can see that the bone is attached to the root. But when we extract, we have another level of bone. So how can we manage this kind of problem that we just made by destruction? There is bone that is attached to the root, maintained by the root, not by the implant. But when we take the root out, we have this, this scenario. Very difficult to manage. <laughs> look at this. Very difficult. So look at the resorption that we have. So this is the beginning. And so we, we, we got back and see which are the risk factors for soft tissue recession. And we want to, to learn from what we know about recession. But can we apply this criteria to the implant? Are these the only factors that are affecting our implantology, our immediate implantology today? OK, just to, to show you what is happening, I want to take a quick review of these articles. And an interesting way to read articles, scientific articles, is what you can find after a few years that things that they didn't want to uh, to, to look for. They were looking for something and they found another thing. So this is important because they weren't looking, they won't want to prove nothing and they found another thing. And so this, you have to pay attention to these cases. Goran Benik in 2011. They were wanting to see the dimension of buccal bone and mucosa at the immediately placed implants after seven years. Because we have, by that time, the technology of CBCT. So they say, hey, we have, can now see exactly what happened with our buccal plate. So the purpose was to study soft and hard tissues, 24 implants. But the most important thing is that the gap were filled with a xenogenic bone. You know, we said, what is a xenogenic bone? A low turnover material, filling. OK, it's going to be there. OK. With a good membrane. Yes, a very good membrane. Then we put the prosthesis, extraction sites were in the anterior zone, and extraction site interesting with healthy neighbor teeth. OK. They remain well, and they measure Many things, the keratinized gingiva and the alveolar crest. They took many measures, but pay attention to those parameters. Before, the, they say the, the, the second CBCT, they study, they painted with a radiopaque resin just to see the relationship between the soft tissue and the bone. What happened with the keratinized gingiva? It was reduced by 33% in seven years alone. Uh, is this important? Yes, it is. We know from the Canulo article 2015 that when we get to the limit of two millimeters, the patient does not brush correctly, is now bleeding. And most important, we have regenerated the neck of the bone the neck of the implant, the perimplantitis is more and more frequently. So slowly, a healthy implant is becoming to the risk zone, alone by itself, a successful implant. This is a phenomenon in terms that Maurice told that the gingiva is getting weaker. What happened with the distance from the implant shoulder to the bone, crystal bone? At the beginning, it was two millimeters. But now, look at this. How much how, it's more higher now. And they say, what happened here? What happened? Look at this. There was no bone on buccal bone, on the buccal part of the maxilla. Many implants were like this, without any buccal bone, successful implant. And only we, we realized because of the CBCT. What were the conclusions? Interesting. That the 35% of the cases has 
completely absent buccal wall. This is a thing, uh, to, uh, an idea to think and to be wary about. And the, the worst thing of all that is happened in 2011 and four out of five cases, they were completely regenerated with BIOS. So where is the BIOS? We used to say, no, BIOS stays there forever, eight years, 10 years. I open a flap, I still see BIOS. But in these cases, when the, the buccal bone resorts, there is no more BIOS. OK, second article. Miyamoto, interesting case. They were trying to study the difference, again, with CBCT study, the difference between delayed versus immediate implants. So, and the delayed in two cases, one group with non-resorbable membrane, second group with a resorbable membrane. These are the images, group one, two, and three. What they found is, again, something interesting, that group one maintains the bone better. Group two, 50% recession and vertical bone loss after six months. And group three, 71 remarkable gingival recession and vestibular buccal loss. Oh, this is a problem. But look, look the suggestion. Immediate implant placement may require technical modification so that healthy heart tissue can be preserved, maintaining two millimeters of labial bone thickness after completion of restorative treatment. Why the two millimeters number? Since 2005, Uli Grunder showed this, we are still repeating each other, we need two millimeters, we need two millimeters, or three, or four. No, no, we need the bone, because the natural teeth has no two millimeters of bone. So, if immediate implantology is having problems, what else do we have? Early implant placement, that means I took the teeth out, I wait six weeks or eight weeks, tissues are healthy now, and then I begin re-entry. And so, Danny Busser showed us this beautiful article, 20 cases, they follow by six years, and what is his conclusion? The conclusion is that they have, the bone is still there, you can see the CBCT, and, and we have pleasing aesthetic outcomes overall. But nowadays, I'm not satisfied with this pleasing aesthetic. Because he showed these images, the 20 cases, and he showed the, the CBCT images. But if we look at this, there is no doubt that if there is two millimeters at least of bone. But look at the result. Do you see a depression? Yeah, I see a depression. He, in every tooth, there is a convexity. When the implant is a concavity, light is different. Another case, F. Is there bone? Yes, there is. Bios, yes, but look at this. This is a natural teeth, this is an implant. I don't like this. Another case, is there bone there? Yes, it is. What happened here? Depression, little scars, bluish zone. Is there bone? If there is, look at this, canine. So, why does it happen? I explained in, at dinner with friends with, with, with two plates. Suppose these are those sockets. If we put an implant in the posterior zone and then we fill it with BIOS or low turning material, whatever you like it, and we are happy the first day, second day, first month, but what happens? We have three, five millimeters and then two millimeters. It gets a resorption. What happens with the mucosa? is adapted to the resorption. What happened with the bouncing of light? This on the neighbor teeth, but this on the implant teeth. Okay, so you see here there is an area that is showing problems in a, in a very near future. So, what does, this is, uh, I want you to pay attention to the next article. And, and, and I think it's the, the last one. 
This article is very, very important due to read, just to believe me. <laughs> because we were thinking, talking about uh, immediate implant outcomes, but we were just putting in the same bag different animals, a cat, a dog, a cat. and so we, we thought that they were all the same, and this article showed us that human beings, we are not all the same. They made extractions, and after important eight weeks, they took a CBCT at the, the post-operative and a second CBCT eight weeks after. And they superimposed the first image with the second just to see how much vertical and horizontal resolution do we have. And what they did want to ask, this is the most interesting thing, they were worried about what happened in central area and the proximal areas. This was the research. But what they found is much, much more important, is the key to all our problems. It, that is, and this outcome, it does not depend on age or gender. It happens in all human beings, no matter the age or gender. And you see, oh, there is a big resorption at central sites and low resorption on proximal sites because the, the tooth maintains the bone on proximal sites, not at the central socket. But when they make a distribution, re correlation with the thickness of the fascial wall and the percentage of vertical bone resorption, they found that a very strong positive correlation that says if the buccal wall is less than one millimeter or one millimeter, you get sometimes 100% of buccal resorption. 100. So, this is going to be very worry for me because this was a major finding that does not depend on what material we put into the socket to fill the gap. The problem is which was the thickness of my fascial wall before or the day of destruction, because this is going to make the future of the outcome of this patient. And when they separated, look at the, how different they, they behave. The thin gets a higher resorption and the thick is very low. So these are different. So we have two patterns, but this is um, thickness, thick and, and thin. And the findings were that we knew that we got buccal resorption, but there were studies in dogs, Araujo, Linde, Cardaropoli, and we, were, uh, we thought that the problem was two or three millimeters, not more. But in humans, <laughs> it's much more because it's three times, maybe 10 millimeters resorption. Okay, second, we have two different patterns. In the central, we have more resorption. And the end, we have two bone phenotypes in the human beings, in my patient. So, Monday morning will come a patient to extract an ins a central incisor. Which type, biotype is my patient? I don't know. But statistically, this is the, the, the you can use the article of Mariano San and Gui Hamba that shows that 87% of the human beings are thin biotypes. Only 13 are thick bone biotypes. And I put this just to tell that what the, our terminology is confusing because we said, no, we have a thick biotype, thick tissue, soft tissue biotype. But it's not correlation between this proportion with this. And I'm worried about the bone biotype, no the soft tissue biotype. Uh -huh. So if we lose bone because of the extraction, we have to reformulate our extraction protocol. We have to optimize the site. What does it mean this? We know that periodontum, we study always periodontum, and which are, how do we say? PDL. 
What does it mean, L? Fibers. Look at this. When you search in Google by the L, you always see these images. Fibers, fibers. But I want to show you images of the periodontum that is the microvascular network that is behind. And when we extract a teeth, we take this out. And this is what the, we have to change our minds. PDL for PTC, because it's a periodontal tissue complex that we are, bless, that we, that we are having problems because when we take out of the microvascular network, what happens? Our bundle bone that is in the buccal crest, you see those white spots there? The white spots there. You know what it is? This is a cross section of all the vessels that feed this bone. Look at this. This vessel feed that part. And we used to think that the bundle bone was all uh, maintained by the buccal vessel of the periosteum. And it is not true. What does maintain is the periodontum. So we know this article of Araujo, 2005, that show us that the, when we extract the teeth, the buccal bone gets resorption. So, as Maurice told, and I, I don't want to explain because I have no time, uh, the socket shield technique, Hürzler put this um, implant in contact with the root of the animal, and he, he said that we have two findings interesting, that the remaining root has no sign of inflammation and PDL look normal, first of all. Second, the root was attached to bone by a healthy periodontum. And you see the images. The implant is completely integrated, sometimes touching the shield. And, when, and he said, because he, proved, he made this uh, proof of principle, and he showed us only four images. And this changed our way of doing implantology, immediate implantology. So he said, there is always, between the implant and the bone, a, a bone surrounding. Okay. The conclusion, he was very, how I gonna say, simple. Retaining the buccal aspect of the root during implant placing does not appear to interfere with those integration and may be beneficial preserving the buccal bone. Because look at this, for the first time in our life in 2010, we realized that the buccal bone not, was not resorbed. Okay, now I want to share with you a world premiere because I, I've been doing some research uh, on, on dogs and we, I want to share with my pet family um, the histologies. Look at this. The thing was, we were discussing at the forum that what to do with the shield, to cut, flush with the bone, or, or maintain it to one or two millimeters upper the, the crystal bone. So uh, I did in eight beagle dogs, eight implants, eight socket shield, and four shields were prepared flush with the bone and four non flush We did that at the Universitat de Veterinaria at Rod Codina in Lugo, Spain. That is a, a center, international center for investigation, very important. And I want to show you quickly our histologies. We have shield implant contact makes an occlusive because soft tissues does not penetrate. Buccal bone level is preserved. You see? Interesting. This uh, first finding. The threads can touch directly to the shield without any bone in the, in the medial. Wow. Different. No matter the thin, how thin could be the buccal bone that is perfectly preserved. Look at this. This was a shield flush with bone. And the buccal bone grows and covers completely and then goes down and makes us integration with our implant. 
Uh, these images have never been shown before. I, I received it on Sunday, last Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, okay. So, wow, incredible. PDL remains normal, completely covered by crystal bone. Wow. And the next one is more incredible because we found an ankylosis. You can see there, there's no PDL. But what is happening? The tooth is being replaced by bone. That maybe is the best scenario of all because we are not preserving the buccal wall and also we are having more bone. Even and also I want to describe that the tight implant shield contact prevents the successfully the soft tissue migration to apical. Okay, but I know you like it, but we have to come back to clinic. We are implantologists, not, not scientists. So, again, where is the implant here in this image? Uh, a hint. This is a pontic. <laughs> you have to think which one is the implant. Okay, the solution. Both are implants. Wow. Look at the big bone between the implants. Mm -hmm. This was the case, original case. A fixed partial denture that has to be removed. We did the extractions, but we did socket seal here, here, and here. And here we have a split crest technique, left covered, and after six months, uncovering. And then I want you to difference the, the quality of gingiva, the different. We have to be trained, our eyes, between what is what we would like to maintain, preserve, and what is a 2CTG treatment. It's nice, yes, it's good, it's uh, okay, I, I'm satisfied. But this is a scar. This, if you made the histology of this gingiva, it's a scar. A lot of fibroblasts and fibers, but this is the natural. So we cannot replace this by this. And the question is, if I have extracted those teeth and put the implant, I will end only with this CTG gingiva. Okay. The outcome is nice. But our aim, we have to remember, is to maintain the buccal bone because no soft tissue depression or retraction. We have to maintain the keratinized gingiva with to protect the implant from brushing. Our vascularization through PDL assures there is no color changes and immunological response to the bacteria attack to our implants. And then the gingival fiber similarity with natural teeth. Okay, another case, quick case that you may know. There is uh, a hopeless tooth with a post com completely decemented many times. We split the root, left the buccal wall, put the implant. And because we have good insertion torque, we made the provisional. Okay, after four months, we have the result. And then we have to put crowns. But look at this. If you see the outside, it's like all were teeth. Because inside there, there is a teeth, a tooth, by the way, excuse me. There, were, there is inside a tooth. Uh -huh. The outcome, the x-rays. CBCT images, you can see the plate, the root. Is there some good aperture? Yes, it was. By that time, I, we didn't take care about the good aperture. But this is the image I love. And after two years. So, and I'm not worried about my gingiva. I'm not worried about recession because in, inside and below the gingiva, there is the same tooth, the same PDL as it was for many years in that woman. But what about adjacent implants? Oh, here we have a problem. Here we have this case 
science and I was fortunate. You know why? Because this man came to my office and his wife was with him. <laughs> and I explained to the man, listen, if I take out those uh, teeth and put implants, I will lose the papilla. I will have a little retraction. You will bite perfectly, of course, but you have a, a high smile line, so it's gonna be nice, but not perfect. I can do it perfect. And the wife says, yes, you can do, you will do perfect. <laughs> and the man says, oh, come on, I don't want. Because you, do you notice that the papilla with two roots there is little shorter than the, uh, the opposite? So when you strike here, what would you find? That a completely disaster. So according to Maurice, see these images. See the problem that has the man. It, it was referred to me by a prostodontin. He said, no, I, I don't want to treat this man. <laughs> I don't want to touch it. <laughs> because if I touch, I will have a, a lot of problem. So I proposed to do the socket shield, but before, Think about this. This is the image, ideal images, but th this is the most challenging case that we have that we learn perfectly. Because how can we ca maintain this peak of bone between two implants? This is not possible. This is a drawing. It's not real. Never happens like this. No, this I have never seen. So I strewed as Maurice suggested many years ago, and I am doing more frequently, I strewed before a little those teeth just to get this image. You see? The papilla now is below the original uh, site. From January to April, three months. You can see the image. It, the root is traveling, lifting this shadow, extract, and a particular design, a C shape. Because when you want to have between the two implants uh, the peak of bone to maintain the vascularization, you have to leave this part in between. And so the, 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 the shape of the shield is a C shape. Okay. So I say smile and then a horizontal incision just to see the apex because we do an apicoectomy. Guided surgery and the final image, the papilla preserved by the shield and the shield, the proximal shields. We have a good insertion torque so we can load it as an immediate load. We only, Maurice, I only put PRF inside, because what we need inside our socket, bone, yes, we all want, but with just putting PRF, I, I found bone, so I, I don't feel it with, I used to, and Snehana always likes to put something, but we don't need, I think. Okay, we loaded the apicoectomy, minor os, Membrane and PRF incision. And look at this, this is nice. We have a sandwich that is shield, bone peak, and shield on the other side. Shield, bone peak, and the other shield. The outcome after one week, you, see, you, you notice that the gingiva is lower than the natural teeth on the other side. Okay. Here how it behaves. Look at the dorm at the beginning. The papilla does not follow the line of the papilla of the canine. Now the papilla of the canine is touching and now is a little bit overpassing the root. So uh, here are the CBCT images. This is interesting to see the before and after. The before shape and the aftershave. We are maintaining, preserving the buccal wall. So this is the outcome. 
look at this, <laughs> how I try to copy. Because I tell to my patient, he can, because he came many times for orthodontics, he came alone. And so the last day I say, hey, do you want me to put some new crown, silicone crown, so we can put the four nice together? No way. <laughs> I just want to an end. And I say, because it was difficult to imitate this. Okay. okay, he didn't want it. So when I was a control at the man's, look at this papilla between two, two implants. So this is the, Im the composition image that is interesting, that is only possible because we have below biology, not ti only titanium. And this is the stability at six months. The bone peak maintains at the same level, you see the, these are from implant to implant, from implant to implant, and the bone is still there. Final peaks, five millimeter between two implants, not bad. But most of all, I want you to see the quality of the gingiva. That is, I, have, I haven't done nothing. I knocked well with my hands with CDGs. This was done by nature, but we have preserved the buccal wall through maintaining the socket shield. And I want to show you just a brief case. Another case like this with a, a canine and a first bicuspid that I did before. By that time, Joseph Kahn suggested to do the proximal socket shield. So I said, OK, I do the buccal and the proximal. And I made a T incision just to make it complicated. More easy is to do the C shape. But I did one cut here and another cut there. So I extract the part that I didn't like it and put the implants, uh, get uh, grinded by a, a wall, a diamond board, protect, protecting. This is how Maurice showed. If we are going to do a socket seal, we have to protect here, the, the keratinized gingiva, okay? See the results. Between two teeth and see how nice we maintain the shape because as uh, how we used to say, the canine is the most difficult tooth to treat because it has so thin buccal wall that always when you strike, you lose there the convexity and the light. You cannot um, manage this so well. You have to make many CTGs just to preserve the, the buccal bulk. As we have maintained it here, like it were the roots. And the quality of the tissues. This is what I like to show that the quality of not only the, the measurements, not only the healthy, the, but the, the quality. This is keratinized natural gingiva that was already there. If I would cut, uh, extract the tooth, the roots, oh, it would be a, a complete disaster in that zone. After two and a half years, we still have the shield, the proximal shield and the papilla is maintained. And also, look at these images. It be, has been some remodeling between the root and the implant. See the image before, no, you see? And now it's having some remodeling. These things we have to investigate more what is happening in between. So, my final conclusion is, we used to, we were comfortable with this way of thinking, this way of working. That is, extract, build a bulk with a low resorbent material, and we have this. But this is not enough. We prefer nowadays the pet philosophy that says, please, Maintain what is good there. Don't extract all the teeth. And then 
have the biology do the work and you have these results. So, you may not like my solution, but I tell you a, a funny example. It's like I say, hey, we have to go to this boat, this little boat. And you say, why should I go to this little boat? There is a, a root sitting beside me. I don't know why. And I say to you, because the Titanic is sinking. <laughs> this is the only way to go. <laughs> Maybe you don't like it, but this is the reality. So, ladies and gentlemen, conclusions. A natural process cannot be stopped by any material. We cannot stop the buccal wall resorption, not even with any miraculous material. We know that. It's better to preserve than regenerate that was already there. This is what uh, Sala is trying to convince us, but we know yet that. If bone is there, we don't have to extract but afterwards to put more bone inside. And PET, partial extraction therapy, are here to stay and has more than 10 years with that, documented. So we have to search and read that there are articles showing that this is better. And the last is nice. By gently preserving the bone, our implant surgery will find a way to last. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your kind patience <laughs> and your attention. Uh, see you at Madrid. Thank you.